Thank you. We all exist because of our parents' fertility. Fertility is a crucial selection factor that has determined our own existence, as well as that of many other species. On a societal scale, fertility plays a major role in individual fulfillment. Raising a family can be emotionally rewarding and contribute to a sense of purpose and happiness in one's life. Imagine this. Catherine and Henry met a few years ago. They fell in love and decided to start a family together. However, after trying for more than a year, Catherine could not conceive a child. This meant that they were infertile and that they had to embark on a long journey of emotional distress to find out why. And because I said that Catherine couldn't conceive, you probably all think that she's the cause of their fertility issue. Before talking about the often hidden statistics of infertility, let me first start by defining it. According to the World Health Organization, infertility is defined as the inability of a couple to conceive a child after one year of regular unprotected sexual intercourse. It doesn't mean that a couple won't have a child. It just means that this couple will take longer time to do so. Infertility is actually common and affects approximately 15% of reproductive age couples. This means that today in this room, one over six couples might experience it. Infertility has often been unfairly cast as a woman's problem, but most studies estimate that about half of the cases, the cause is related to a male factor. In the case of Catherine and Henry, it was probably Henry's sperm that was at the heart of the issue. Henry and Catherine's story is actually a true story. I'm not really sure they fell in love, but Henry, or more specifically Henry VIII, was the king of England. <laughs> and he married Catherine of Aragon, with whom he struggled to have children. They ended up having a girl after seven years of marriage, but not a male heir. So he married again. And again, and again, and again, and yet again to five other women to reach his goal. The first three women had mostly stillbirth and miscarriages. The other three did not get pregnant, but it was probably not their fault. According to scientists and historians, the problem with Henry's sperm was that it was genetically damaged, which led to the pre-current pre pre pregnancy loss. But back in the day, it was inconceivable that such a powerful man can be infertile. A man's virility was often judged by his ability to produce sons to carry on the family name. Surprisingly, even today, Men's fertility is surrounded by societal taboos and stigma. Today, I want to shed light on the often overlooked factors that can affect men's fertility, from environmental and lifestyle factors to the lack of open communication around the topic and the importance of breaking the taboo. Semen equality can be evaluated by looking at three important parameters. First, sperm concentration, also called sperm count, which is the number of sperms present in the semen. Second, sperm motility, or how fast can sperms move. And third, sperm morphology, or how good looking sperms are. <laughs> if we take sperm concentration, it seems that it has been decreasing significantly over the past five decades. Studies have shown that it has dropped from around 100 million sperm per milliliter to around 50 million sperm per milliliter. Now, these studies are still debatable in the scientific community as we still question the reliability of the data collected back in the 1970s. However, a 50% drop 
is alarming, and it has received massive public attention. But the question here is, why is it so important? Why does sperm count count? First, sperm count obviously matters in terms of fertility. In general, the more sperms a man has, the higher the chances of his partner becoming pregnant are, but not beyond a value of 50 million sperm per milliliter. In other words, if Henry had 50, 100, or 150 million sperm per milliliter, it won't really change much in terms of fertility. However, if he had less than 50 million sperm per milliliter, this will decrease the chances of Catherine becoming pregnant. Second, sperm count matters, as it has been shown to be an indicator of a man's general health status. Studies have shown that men with lower sperm count have a higher risk of developing cardiovascular diseases, autoimmune diseases, and diabetes. Lower sperm count was also associated with preterm birth and pregnancy loss. This means that a man's sperm count is not only a barometer of his own health, but can determine how healthy the pregnancy of his partner is and whether his child will be born without complications. Third, sperm count matters, as it has been associated with other male reproductive disorders, such as testicular cancer. I'm sure many of you are wondering what is to blame for such trends in male reproductive health. The short answer is that we don't really know. And probably there isn't one simple reason. However, many scientists agree that environmental and lifestyle factors are really important players. These factors are very diverse, and it's really hard to study them on the population level, as they are never isolated. We, as humans, are exposed to many factors in our daily life. They can, of course, affect men during adulthood, but they can also affect men before they are even born, during their mother's pregnancy. In Switzerland, me and my research team at the University of Geneva have took this daunting task seriously. We have conducted one of the largest national studies on the semen equality of 3,000 young men. These men answered questionnaires on their general lifestyle habits. Their mothers also answered questionnaires related to the period close to the conception. And for the past eight years, ladies and gentlemen, I have been exploring which of these multiple factors have strong negative effects on semen equality. Today, I'm going to be giving you one example that I recently studied, and another good example of how the environment can affect semen equality. Now, what is one thing you would hate for getting at home, or feel really lost without? Our phones, you got it. I recently looked at whether men who use more often their phone have a lower sperm concentration. I found that men that use their phones more than 20 times a day had 20% less sperms compared to men using it only once a week. And yes, men using their phones less than once a week existed back in 2005, when we started the study and before the introduction of smartphones. <laughs> now, these men who often use their phones still had an average sperm concentration of around 50 million sperm per milliliter, enough sperms to conceive a child without any problem. Mobile phone use might therefore not directly affect their fer fertility potential, but we still have to look more into this. Other than phones, we are exposed to low doses of certain chemicals present in our environment. In our shampoos when we shower, in the dyes used to tint our clothes, in the plastic cups of our coffee, and even on the apples we eat. These are called endocrine-disrupting chemicals. They are small molecules widely spread around the environment, such as pesticides, for example. 
that are thought to act on the hormonal system and alter its regulation. In the public eye, there is no doubt that these chemicals disrupt reproductive functions. But in reality, there is very few scientific evidence suggesting such a link in humans. I'm sure many of you are wondering what a pineapple has to do here. Back in 1977, many infertility cases were discovered among men working in a pesticide factory in California. These men reported the incidents to occupational health supervisors, and a study was conducted. The study found that men who worked in the factory for longer time periods had 450 times less sperms compared to men who were recently hired. The suspected cause was exposure to a pesticide that is used to control plant parasitic worms that particularly affect pineapples. And bananas too, actually. <laughs> now, these men were, of course, exposed to very high doses of pesticides, to which we are not exposed to in our daily life. However, this is a classic textbook example of how the environment can affect men's fertility. The good news, ladies and gentlemen, is that most of these effects are preventable and even reversible. Sperm production is a continuous process that takes about 74 days in humans. Every day, men produce millions of new sperm. But for this to occur, the problem has to be recognized, understood, and addressed so that appropriate intervention methods can be implemented. This begins with men being more aware of what can affect their reproductive health. Just imagine if men knew more about their reproductive health. Unlike women who have gynecologists that are dedicated to their reproductive health, men lack the equivalent support. Girls start going to a gynecologist at around the age of 15, before they are even sexually active. They learn about their reproductive health, their menstrual cycle, and their general well-being. But when do men go? When do they learn about the sexually transmitted diseases and their potential effect on their own fertility, as well as on the fertility and health of their partners? When do they learn about the increased risk of testicular cancer, which is actually a young man's cancer? Almost never, unless they have a problem in conceiving a child. This leads to most men having poor knowledge of how to maintain good reproductive health. Studies actually show that men are interested in being involved in fertility discussions, but feel simply uninvited. I think it's about time to recognize this gap and make a collective effort to have this changed. Today, I've shown you just the tip of the iceberg. Semen inequality is vulnerable and is sensitive to many factors that I did not have time to talk about today. We as scientists still have a lot of work to do in exploring the links between fertility and the environment. But meanwhile, if you ask me whether a man should spend less time on their phone, avoid smoking and drinking a lot of beer, I would say it's a probably a good idea, especially if they want to become fathers soon. Not only because it might be important for sperm counts, but having a rather balanced lifestyle is important for different health aspects. But it's not only about science. We as a society have to engage in open communication around the topic. Men need to feel more comfortable in discussing their reproductive health with friends, partners, and healthcare providers. Unlike Catherine and Henry, couples today have luckily access to assisted reproductive techniques to have a child without having to marry six times. 
But despite this access, stigma has kept men silent for far too long and has held them back from learning about their reproductive health. This has negatively impacted both men and their partners. In many cultures, male infertility is still highly stigmatized. Male fertility is still highly associated with virility and masculinity, creating feelings of guilt and shame. I hope I could convince you that sperm count count for many reasons, but not as an indicator of masculinity. I will leave you with this thought. Our ability to address male fertility and semen equality is not only about science. It's about open minds and open hearts. Thank you. <laughs>